Hey Big Geeks and welcome to Track Brewing. We have made the journey up to Manchester so that I could try for the first time Sonoma on cask. And I've come up to Manchester because I wanted to drink Sonoma on keg. And probably at the end of this video when we go home, we'll probably take some cans away. It's all about Sonoma, mate. Exactly, all formats all the time. So Sonoma's one of the reasons we've come up to track. They've been one of my favorite breweries for a long time, mostly based off of this beer. I drank so much of it during lockdown because I wanted a 3.8% juicy kind of thing. And it's been one of my favorite little kind of hazy pails for a long time. But obviously it's not always hazy. It's beautifully clear in cast compared to the keg version. We're going to be talking about the little tweaks that are made for the different formats, but we're also going to be talking about this. So what I love about track as well is the incredible diversity of, of what they brew. Yes. Like big imperial stouts, little crispy sours, beautiful pilsners poured on side pour here at the at the beautiful tap room. West Coast and IPAs, West Coast Johnny. West Coast IPAs, wow. as well as New England IPAs. And milkshake and IPAs. And milkshake IPAs. Yeah, we'll address that towards the end of uh, the interview. So yeah, what follows is now a little tour of the brewery, which is a beautiful space. Uh, and we'll be chatting to uh, Matt and Stefan, Matt Ted Brewer, Stefan's head of marketing, and chatting about the story uh, of track uh, and how they came up with a beer that works however you bloody drink it. Cheers, mate. Cheers. excited this is my first trip to track whichever location you've been in and i'm not sure i've been in a more beautiful uk tap room than this it's stunning thank you very much Thanks very much yeah um talking of stunning the clarity and the head retention on this why is that is that because unreal. it's poured with a sparkler or is that oh god okay he's gone straight there he's gone straight there <laughs> sorry i just get out of the way get out of the way at the we start. said it we, we can all move on yeah sparklers suck tell me tell me about the the origins of, of track because it's it's come a long way to, to get to yeah, this point, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Sam, who sadly can't be with us today, did the uni thing, kind of got a job straight out of uni into London, uh, into the kind of like the finance world. Absolutely hated that. And as you do, we was really keen on cycling, so decided to just take a two-year trip around the world, just cycling. Yeah. Reevaluate, start again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and kind of, and cycling was his passion and his dad's passion as well, so he kind of followed on that. And then um, the first bit of that journey kind of took him from the east coast to the west coast of the States, and it was kind of through that journey that he's really started coming across these kind of little tap rooms and breweries and things. Um, did, did he have any brewing experience or was it like, I've had this idea? He, he didn't at that point. Um, yeah. And then came back to the UK, um, ended up working in a brewery in London for 18 months or so. Little known Camden Brewery. Oh, yeah. yes, guys, sure. You might have found them. You might yeah. have heard of them. Um, and then started looking for a site for the brewery. London wasn't, you know, financially so yeah. so great, but his uh, family are all up in the northwest, so came up to Manchester and found a spot 200 yards down the road from this one. Yeah. So yeah, so you haven't travelled a long way. No. But no. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, in... he, he did all the travelling at the start, yeah, yeah. and then this, we've travelled very little since then. <laughs> but it's, it feels like you know, if he was travelling the states and he was seeing all of these beautiful tap rooms, that's clearly something that was an important ambition for you guys because you. Yeah, yeah. You've taken your time and built something pretty special here. Yeah, I mean, like, every time people kind of step into this space, I'm always just, like, quick to say this, like, this is seven years in the making. Like, this is not, yeah. like, oh, we just got some money and built this thing. It's like, yeah, no, we... Which is increasingly common in craft beer. It's like the startup money is there and yeah. you build it from, right, from right. the start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, like, our third iteration of a tap room, I guess. And we decided it would be the last one, so we better <laughs> yeah. get it right. Yeah. Well, hopefully the last, yeah. For the plans of when we got out of the old site, the light at the on the horizon when it was like the hardest days and we were working like every hour was that one day we'd have a space like this. And I don't know if Matt feels the same, but like to me it's actually better than I imagine it to be. 
like as a space like it's yeah it's, it's that perfect mix of production yeah. and consumption in one you catch yourself one. every now and again going this is this is really good actually isn't yeah it? um yeah so so i'm head brewer and that side's a dream to work on compared to the old site and then you get to have a pint straight away and watch everyone else enjoy it as well it, it's been amazing it's been amazing and that's it like bringing people a little bit more into the production side and that kind of relationship with product and then yeah. what you are consuming that is always something that we've always wanted to kind of yeah get to. as a brewer the feedback loop is so quick yeah you can launch a product and then the next morning say to the bar staff like how did it go down how, how yeah. was that yeah the idea being that we should be able to serve a drink to whoever walks in yeah whether they like beer or not we should be able to find them something which might well we'll get into it but that might explain why you know in the craft beer world you guys have Pretty diverse in terms of the the, the styles that you're We're making. We're in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe you weren't before because I guess in a smaller brewery, you were very reliant on what we were drinking. Now yeah. you had to keep churning that. that yeah, out yeah. Was like popular. Sam had already like nailed down the pale ales, and especially in cask, that's first couple of years. That's all he was doing, and then we broadened it out to stronger IPAs and dippers became a big thing when. Cloudwater were hitting their V series and everything, um, and then yeah, you just keep on adding strings to the bow. Yeah. So, so I remember the first the first track beer I had was uh, it was a can of Sonoma. Nice. Okay. And I remember tweeting about it, and I said, you know, it's brilliant to see the New England take at, at this lower ABV. Yeah. And I got a tweet back from somebody going, it's not a New England beer, and that's uh, <laughs> you guys are laughing already, but to me in can. It's yeah. a New England like session IPA, session yeah. pale. On cask, it's very much not that. Yeah. So what is the thinking between having this beer that you know has three identities: keg, cask, yeah, and yeah. Can. So you're brewing it technically differently for each format. A little bit, right. like yeah. uh, all the same hops, all the same malts. Water profile slightly different. Um, this is like really hazy before it goes into a cask. And then I think there is a there's a point, isn't there, for me especially where there's an expectation from a can drinker, which might be different to an expectation from a cast drinker. And you're just trying to keep everyone happy. Yeah. So it's kind of like, okay, well, if I just tweak this water profile this way and hit more New England, like high in chlorides and all that, then it makes that 3.8% beer taste a little bit bigger, which is all good for, for us. How much of what you make is Sonoma now? How, how um, we're up to about 50%. And we could have done more, but um, there was no sort of desire to become that big production brewery just slugging away. Cascale's not very, it's, it's labor intensive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not super it's easy to do. Malleting, yeah, fucking yeah. caps yeah. forever. Yeah, and... getting the dirty ones back, cleaning yeah, them out. Yeah. Um, and what we're trying to do is just create a place and a, a workspace where people can be creative, it can be fairly relaxed, and we can sort of just follow our nose a little bit to make the best beer we can without being like tied down to all oh, right we've got to do you know x yes, amount of sonoma monday to... tuesday wednesday at sonoma yeah yeah yeah, yeah. because yeah. then you're a factory it must be a real philosophical challenge to go like we could brew so much more of this i mean we were just over cloud Wars across the way there like we could have kept going with the b series forever yeah. yeah but it wasn't what we wanted to do and we didn't think we could keep keep people interested so we, yeah. we we moved away yeah and you guys are treading that line as well but with a very different beer <laughs> yeah yeah it's like the same beer all all the time and i don't know like especially cask beer is especially after the pandemic i think everyone's like realized just what a product it is and how. Yeah, have, you, have you seen that little like uptick I'm, in thank fuck cask is back yeah well for yeah, our, for our like own it. selves it's yeah. always just sold out <laughs> super quick anyway yeah. so um but yeah, you, but at the minute we, we've up to the amount of cast we're doing and it's all just flying. So um, as a brewing nation, that is our USP. That's yeah, what everyone wants when they come, you know, if they're Americans or Belgians. They, they come in and go cast an oven. They want to start on cask. Yeah. Because so I, they can't get it anywhere else. That's, that's our unique that's a brewing story that makes yeah. us different to everyone else. It's all the other styles in a way we're kind of copying people, whether it's yeah. a German pills or a New England. Like, I think we do. You, we've got to keep on doing it. When I like, I always tell people I almost got sold cask back to me from by the Americans because I went on the you know the usual kind of craft beer journey of like 
trying to hop the IPA on keg and just be like, what? This is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then just going into an absolute tear of all these different styles. And then, you know, we had Americans come over and visit us or like come and visit Cloudwater. And every time they'd be just like, where's the cask? Like, yeah. where's the cask? And then you suddenly realize, you're just like, wow, this is like, this is a really special, super it's regional. It's exotic to the Americans. Like, I've spoken to so many beer writers in the States who are, I love Green King IPA, and you're like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, just, just the format is, is entirely kind of unique to them, the same way yeah. that we might feel about, you know, Tank Pilsner or Kell in the Czech Republic, or yeah, yeah. Karls Augustina in Munich, or the biggest, boldest West Coast IPA you could possibly get over in the States. Speaking yeah. of which. Okay, let's go. Uh, you finish your pint. We've talked about Sonoma and how it's, you know, it's, it's yeah. probably led to your ability to experiment a little bit. Yeah. So should we taste something of you guys boarding out? Yeah, sure. And I feel like you guys have really gone for the West Coast side. Was that because of the Bagby collaboration or in reaction to the amount of hazy stuff you were making? Brewers um, were like, I want something cleaner. Following that line of like trying to broaden the styles out, like we did, we did the Bagby collaboration, struck a chord with a few people in the brewery. So, you know, let's do another, let's see if we can do a, a 7% and then a 5% and sort of like not master them all, but I've, I've learned in myself that I really enjoy problems and just solving them. Whether I like the end, whether I like a West Coast IPA or not, I really want to be able to make one. Okay. Which is quite an unusual approach to brew, because a lot of people are, are like, you know, I brew what I want to drink. But, yeah, the, but the thing about asking a brewer what he wants to drink is just lager yeah. all the time. So like, <laughs> we can't that. become a lager producer all the time. I but Matt's, Matt's done an awesome job. Like, I've seen him grow as a brewer, like from the start. And, it's interesting that he says he's basically trying to solve problems. Uh, like if you look at our beer board now, it's like super eclectic right across the spectrum. And I'd yeah. say that he hits every note of like every style and we're lucky enough to have collaborated with, I think that collaboration with Jeff at Bagby, like he is so dedicated to the craft of brewing. Like when you do a collaboration, it can come in many different forms. It can go like low kind of, uh, I don't know, like information sharing. Techie. Yeah, techie, or it can go full techie. Like, Jeff is full yeah. tech. Like, when we did it, the first one with him, we, we created our mash tun into a hot bag. Yeah, yeah. And we laced yeah. it with like, which we'd never done before. He was like, right, we want to get loads on the hot side. And so, we had like this just yeah. big, thin kettle, so we could only achieve a certain right. profile. Yeah, but, yeah, Jeff basically said, well, you don't have a whirlpool, so whirlpool in the mash tun with um, whole cone hops, because that's how he uses whole cone hops as a dry hop rather than pellets at times. Um, he brews, in fact, in quite an English way. Yeah. yeah. Just on the, on the west coast of America. Find, you do find quite common on the west coast. I mean, like, you know, like Vinny Upper Russian River still brewing with sugar, still using whole cone as well. There's yeah. a, a traditionalism to west coast IPA that's completely lost in New England. Because yeah. with that leaf yeah. matter, with all that green leaf matter you get, uh, the polyphenols, they stick to the side of your mouth and that's what dries it out. Right, yeah. That yeah. adds to that mouthfeel that, 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 yeah. that you get. Yeah, so it's part of the character of the beer. So a lot of times people just make this with pellets or cryo. It, it ticks most of the boxes, but then it just disappears off the tongue and it's not quite that. But I think our West Coast are like, they're pretty like assertive. They're they're like they, they, they <laughs> lead, they're, they're long, like a, like a whiskey or something like that. Like it doesn't just fade, it, it, yeah. it keeps it's going. A ghost of the beer that will last well yeah. beyond like the last two. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's been it's been really cool to see again Matt and the team dive into these styles and just like for me, you know, I'm I'm not a brewer, so but like to be able to test my palate against all these different things and kind of and see how we're progressing. I don't know, it's just it's it's always exciting to try like a different beer out of the tank. We've been doing it for seven years and I never get bored of like the idea yeah, yeah. of like trying a lager out of the tank, trying trying a West Coast out of the tank and See, and, and seeing the whole process through to the end till, till, till it gets to that product. Do you ever struggle to keep an identity of, of the beers that Track make? You know, as you start to extend out to making lots of everything, how do you tell the consumer what, what Track is, yeah, is about? Yeah, what to expect when they see a Track yeah. can? 
Yeah. I think the the underlying theme that runs throughout is uh, just drinkability. Like everything we make is is it has a balance, whether it's a you know lactose sour yeah. <laughs> or or a West Coast pale. Um, there's a, there's a balance and there's drinkability there that we seem to like probably through process more than anything else, it just finds its way into our cans and, and glasses. A little cheesy here, but I guess I'd say, like, instead of building like what someone expects on the drink bill, I'd just say you're building trust with the consumer, which is basically saying that like, if you're gonna drink this beer, or if you're gonna buy this much, you're gonna know that it's been cared for, and that like, we have tried our hardest within that style to produce something so it's enjoyable. Like you, you might not like sours, but trust us, it's a track sour, so you're gonna... Well, not in the sense that that, like, I mean, if you don't like sours, then it might, it might just not be your thing, but yeah. I just mean that like, as, as what the style is, it's like trust that we're gonna do it to the best of our ability, and hopefully that translates into a great beer at the end of it. So you're saying not all breweries are doing that? Uh, I don't know. Like I just when we were just talking, then I was just I was just thinking. For me, that's it's kind of you start like when I see a beer by I don't know like Cloudwater over the road. I trust that those brewers are giving it everything to produce the best in that style that they possibly can. And again, it's been great to see Matt and the team kind of experiment and really push their boundaries of understanding and our own of what like I mean what beer is these days. It, it, it covers. As Matt said at the start, when someone walks in, when they say, I don't like beer, what does that even mean anymore? Like, how can yeah, you, absolutely. like, you look at that board, you've got a super sweet pastry style that tastes like coffee and chocolate to a super dry West Coast pale ale. Well, I think the way that we round off this interview is to bring out one of your gold tops. Okay. okay. Um, and see if drinkability is at the heart of it. See if we can trust something that's, you know, so unlike the two beers that we've just drunk. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. also something well, that's well. coming to define you guys a little bit as well. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's go. Now, I don't think, I don't think that that's in the BJCP guidelines. I could be wrong. What, what is a gold top beer? Okay, so, um, Ultimately, it's, it's a take on an American style. It's a double IPA with lactose. We wouldn't want to call it a milkshake IPA because we're not adding fruit or spice or anything else. And so we just, we put our thinking caps on and we thought about what would an English beer be called if it was beer with lactose. Breakfast Dipper was one of them. Breakfast Dipper came Breakfast out there. Dipper. Lots of things with oats and all that sort of thing. Um, and then we fell on Gold Top as uh, nothing more English than a milk the bottle. Full fat milk. <laughs> yeah. the, the, well, it's, it's the best you can get. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I quite agree. So, what, what, what's the, the logic of adding sweetness to a beer that's traditionally quite bitter? Um, so, I guess you're sort of emulating more of the fruit notes in it, you bring in the hops out more. Um, lactose is packed with protein. So you're just building in more body and that silkiness in there. Um, and I guess it has a, for me, it has like a almost vanilla-ish sort of like underlying flavor that, that complements well. It smells like the red milk bottles, kind of right. berries and milk bottles. Yeah. But it's actually, the, the lactose character is very, very restrained compared yeah. to what most people would associate with a milkshake IPA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sure. you have gone for that drinkability angle, even on a beer that's... Yeah. Trying to that find silkiness. balance in there. Yeah, yeah. There's... Why do you think it is that drinkers are loving sweeter, juicier beers? I guess there's... A, I mean, with sweetness does come a, does come a pleasure, you know? Like, it's, it's interesting. I always reference, like, when uh, I spoke to... I can't remember... Yeah, Evan at Green Cheek, and he was like, bitterness is not a flavor profile that humans are evolved to like, and yet- It's a sign of poison. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's so, why we make be bleach bitter, so you don't drink it. Yeah. Exactly, so, so it's weird. It's weird that, I guess, with these beers that were like, why do you think people like sweeter when actually- yeah, I'm asking be, the wrong question. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> why do people like to. bitter? <laughs> like, but with, with beer, we, we associate bitterness and like that's something that kind of adds character to it. But fundamentally, I guess a palate enjoys a sweet edge to it. The hop expression 
The first one we did, I remember getting out of the tank and the hop expression was so big. You're just like, wow, like that is insane. How much, how much difference it's made just adding that lactose that's brought forward the hops as well. Um, it's funny because I remember like being around the, uh, the old master in the old site and just trying this. Movie. It was like, what do you think people are going to think of this? And then yeah. it was like, I think people are going to like it. And then it just was like, <clears throat> drinkers are often talking about how do we define a good brewery? How do we know what a good brewery is? And I think probably one really great sign of a brewery is that you can sell a cask, American hops, but pretty yeah. traditional, sessionable cask scale and an 8% lactose IPA, probably to the same people walking through the door and have them drink their way through it yeah. and, really not, and show them that quality and that trust. That it, I think that's the, that's the beauty of like, I guess what like Matt's done and Sam just done as well is the start is that like, there are people in pubs in Stockport who drink Sonoma, like yeah. 50, 60 year olds who might have drank Tetley's or Robbo's before, yeah. uh, who love that beer. And then there's also people who are like in older age groups who might come in and just drink our gold tops or something. It's like hitting such a wide demographic and trying to find something for everyone is, is I guess we're just people pleasers. So cheers guys, cool. thanks for having us. Thanks very much. Cheers man, thanks so much. Cheers. So major takeaways from that interview. One is I've now had a lactose IPA I've enjoyed, which I never thought would happen. Sorry, Johnny. I just wanted to repeat that for everyone at home. Uh, you liked a lactose IPA. Milkshake IPA is the next big thing, I tell you. <laughs> wow. You've, got... <laughs> You've changed. I've changed, man. In literally Track one Track has changed you. It has. A lot of breweries, when they talk about what they want to be known for, pretty much all of them say drinkability, right? It's one of those yeah. cliches. But actually, you know, if you're going to be able to make a lactose IPA that somebody who hates lactose IPAs can really drink and enjoy, I think that is a sign that they are taking that philosophy actually seriously rather than just kind of making it a talking point, even though you're making 8% thick dippers. There's, you can, there's love in everything here from the space to obviously the liquid. And I think you can sort of see the love in the different formats and how they, they treat the same beer differently for a different drinking experience. I think that says a lot about them as a brewery. And for, yeah, and for a different customer base as well, which was a really interesting kind of thought that, you know, if breweries are going to continue to grow in tougher climates, uh, with everything that's happening in the world, you're going to need to cater to wider audiences and to different people. You're going to need to, you know, impress the, the old school real ale drinker and the sort of the modern new drinker and the people that dislike beer and the people that really fucking love beer. And I, I'm not sure I know of a brewery in the UK. I mean, maybe Cloudwater just over the road that are so good at producing so many different styles and attracting such a wide base. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, train cans of Sonoma it is then. Cheers.